This is Bigger Questions with your host, Robert Martin. Welcome to Bigger Questions, recorded live in Melbourne. Today's big question, why would someone trust God in the face of suffering? Today's show is being recorded live at Melbourne University in partnership with Melbourne University Christian Union and St. Jude's Uni Church. And we ask today's question today to two people. Bryn Waitman grew up in Bendigo and then studied a Bachelor of Music and Masters of Teaching at Melbourne University. He worked as a drum teacher for three years before starting an apprenticeship in Christian ministry at Melbourne Uni. And he joins me now. Please welcome Bryn Waitman. Our second guest is Andy Prido. Andy is a senior staff worker with the Christian Union at Melbourne University. He's been wrestling with the message of the Old Testament book of Job for the last 20 years and is currently writing a book about the book of Job. Please welcome Andy Prido. <laughs> Brian and Andy, welcome to Bigger Questions. Thanks for having us. That's great, yeah. Well, to kick off Bigger Questions, we like to ask a couple of smaller questions. We do try to have a bit of fun on the show. Today we're asking Andy Prido and Bryn Waitman about why someone would trust God in the face of suffering. Now, the biblical book of Job deals with this idea. So in our quiz, I thought we'd test you on how much you know about Job. There's two questions, both multiple choice. Question one, if you type Job into an internet search engine, you get some 3.2 billion hits. What is the top result? Is it A, the Wikipedia entry for the biblical book of Job, B, job ads for Seek or Indeed, C, backpacker jobs, or D, Job the Opera Requiem, written by two Ukrainian composers and first performed at the 2015 Gogglefest Festival? Oh, so wow. which of those is the top result? Mm. Is this a team you sport? Can, or? Uh, not necessarily. <coughs> right. No. Depends on how well you go, I suppose. Yeah. I'll lock in B, thanks. You'll lock in B. Job ads for Seeker and D. What about you, Andy? I was going to go B as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd advise that. Yeah. Uh, good? Yeah, good. Okay, because the answer actually is B. Yes, oh. correct. That's right. Yeah. Um, does it surprise you that a book of Job is not the top search engine answer? No, sadly no. Sadly no. no. But, but I think that the book of Job will outlive the job seek, <laughs> the uh, website or whatever it is. Okay, yeah. right. I would say for Melbourne Uni students, job seeking and suffering go hand in hand. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> we'll talk about that a bit more perhaps in the future. Yeah. Well, I was an art student, so yeah. <laughs> so question two. A writer on the online sports opinion website The Raw wrote an article entitled The Tragic Figure of AFL Footballer Job Watson. Mm. He said, does anyone's given name match the events of its biblical character's counterpart so precisely? Now, what specific events was he referring to about Job Watson's life? Was it A, the TV station switching to news and not showing his farewell speech live after his final match? Was it B, ending his career by losing by 65 points to Sydney and then coming home to discover that he'd been given a parking fine? Was it C, <laughs> being booed by crowds, being banned from the sport for a year and losing his Brownlow medal? Or was it D, raiding parties, sweeping down and stealing all of his camels? <laughs> so which of those specific events was this online website speaking about? No, and it, Job it, Watson's life. It needs to be pointed out that this Job is Job with an E. So there's that's a bit right, of a there's discrepancy. A slight, there's a, that's right. There's a slight, there's so, still, it's still about Job, though. Yeah, yes. So, yeah, but it rules out D, I think. Right, okay. The, the cattle, the camel. I that, think that's because that's, that's the biblical character. That's the biblical okay, character. Okay, so uh, correct. It does rule out D. So well, I was the, hoping for an all of the above option, but okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say C. So we'll say C. Yeah, surely losing a brown low. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right, yeah. Uh, and the correct answer is indeed C. Congratulations, right. yes. Now, you don't think that Job Watson owns many camels? Oh, look, I haven't. I'm not aware <laughs> that he, he does, but... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Well, Andy and Bryn, congratulations. That have a two. You got two of our two smaller questions right. A big hand for Andy and Bryn. Yeah. Doing well. We're doing well. Now, Andy, the biblical book of Job. It's a little different to Job Watson's career. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? It's pretty big. It's forty-two chapters long. You spent twenty plus years wrestling with it. Mm. What happens? Yeah. So basically, it's a riches to rags story. Yeah. So it's about a man who has it all and loses it all in one foul swoop. Yep. And most of the book is him grappling or trying to make sense of his life, particularly trying to understand the goodness of God or questioning the goodness of God to him and to the world that he's living in and the light of this suffering that he's gone through. Right. So it's a lot of the book is actually really honest 
painful questioning and lament, right. actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there was a difference between the biblical Job and the Essendon footballer Job, wasn't there? I mean, for example, the biblical Job really was blameless, whereas mm. Job Watson, well, maybe he was ambiguous, perhaps, is the best way to put it. So yeah. what was the particular challenge that the biblical Job had to deal with? Yeah, so that's really important, actually, that the book of Job is really clear from the start that Job's done nothing uh, to deserve this. In fact, he's held up as an exemplary figure by God himself. Yeah. And that's really important because a, a number of the friends who have almost a karma-like view of existence are wanting to say uh, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. There's a lot of bad stuff happening to this guy. God must be punishing him. Mm -hmm. And until Job recognises that and turns away from that, uh, he's going to keep suffering. Yeah. Job keeps saying, that's not true. Yeah. And we know it's not true as people who've read the opening chapters. But that's a big part of the grappling as well. How do I make sense of a just God in the light of the, the semi-injustice of my life? Or unexplained suffering, perhaps. And unexplained suffering, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. So what made you interested in studying it for 20 plus years? I've often said to people that I uh, find the strugglers in the Bible really encouraging. I mean, all of the Bible deals with God interacting with real people because that's what God does. He, he speaks into the real world and deals in the lives of real people. But I particularly find it encouraging where you see people who are really struggling and asking hard questions. And it's for people who it's hard to trust in God because that, that's often been my experience. Yeah. So I, I find it very comforting to see that I'm not alone in that kind of a struggle. You've asked God hard questions in your life. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. found the book of Job resonates with that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's. I find it honest and encouraging. Now, the big question of why someone would trust God in the face of suffering was an important one for you, Bryn. Maybe can you share us your story? Where did, where did tell us where you grew up and, and your life growing up? Uh, I grew up in a Christian family, mm -hmm. so going to church was a common part of my life. Yeah. So how was that for you growing up? Like you, you went along to church as a kid. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I mean, like I kind of love most things that I do, really, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was fine. I. Enjoyed it a bit. I probably would have preferred to be playing computer games at home, but I went along happily enough. But I just, it didn't really mean much to me, basically. I right. sort of just uh, went, went through the motions. Uh, it had no real impact on my life or my identity. Yep. If I remember at one point thinking, oh, I'll probably think about questions of faith a bit more when I'm 30. That was okay. the, I put a figure on it. All right, when I'm 30, I can sort of get a bit more serious about that sort of stuff. But it was just a bit of, I don't know, maybe another one thing in a list of many hobbies or interests yeah. I had. Okay. Now, you finished high school, then moved to Melbourne and started university. Then something quite significant occurred. Can you tell us what happened? I uh, moved to uni in uh, 2010, moved to Melbourne for uni. And in week four of my first year of uni, I, um, I was on a tram actually coming back from the CBD of Melbourne up Swanson Street. Uh, to Melbourne University and I got a phone call from a friend who I don't think had ever called me before so it was a bit strange and this friend I uh, just started by saying have you heard the news and I guess that sort of made my mind race a lot and and worry and he uh, then told me that uh, a close friend of mine Jamie had died the night before in a car crash mm. in Bendigo. So how did you how did you feel that moment? Yeah well it was a bit I don't know. I felt it was quite surreal, really. I kind of, it was almost like those sort of movie cliches of things just not really sinking in. Um, I was going to a lecture, so I kind of just still headed off to this lecture. Do you remember much about that lecture? No, well, I didn't actually. I sat down, and then that's when things were sort of starting to hit me a bit more, I guess. And I, yeah, so I, I left before the lecture even started. I saw a, a good friend on the way out. And I was starting to get a bit upset. Um, yeah, and he sort of didn't know what to, to make of it. So I just sort of said, oh, sorry, I ought to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then headed off home. Mm. And how did you get home? So I'd actually ridden to uni. So I was riding my bike and I, yeah. That was, a, that was interesting because I think as I was riding, I was getting more and more upset and, and crying quite a bit. And I think, yeah. In fact, I kind of I remember getting a bit distracted by my own crying and riding, thinking people must just think I'm a really pathetic bike rider. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, but what was so? What was what were you feeling at this time? What was hitting you in terms of realization? 
Um, I'd ex experienced death in my family before, like older relatives, grandparents. I guess it's one of those cliches too of you, being a young person, you think you're a bit invincible. You think those sort of things are in the distant future for you or for the people, mm. for your friends. Um, so that just really hit me hard that life is so fragile, that life and death are, you know. Are, are real things. Yeah, real yeah. things that can just occur at any time. Um, and obviously just the enormity of this is a great friend that, uh, yeah, I won't get to see again. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that died so young. Um, mm. Yeah. So you rode home sort of wobbling. Yeah. Uh, you got home. How did it affect you? What, what, what were you thinking about and processing at that time? One thing that comes to mind, I remember at the time thinking, this must be what weeping is. I don't know, I remember. Because I feel like in my life I'd cried before uh, or, be, or been sad about things. But I remember really thinking like, yeah, this must be weeping. This must mm. be crying until I was kind of physically, I guess, sore yeah. uh, from it. Mm. Um, and just, I guess for me, I found I just had this really weird mix of sort of confusion um, but kind of also clarity too in some ways. Mm -hmm. Clarity about? For me, I kind of thought, well, how do I, I don't know, how do I respond to this or what does this, this mean for me? Yeah. And I guess I'd experienced most people in response to something like this saying, I guess, to God, how could you do this? But not really in an actual question way, wanting to find an answer, more in an mm. accusation. How could you let this happen? So did you ask God that question? Yeah, well, I think I did in some senses, but I don't think I was really... I don't know, needing or looking instantly for some logical, rational explanation for it all. Mm. Which, looking back, I'm not sure why I didn't yeah. you just heard really it. look for that. I just, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I just think for myself, a really big question was, can I trust God mm. in this? Mm. I don't really know exactly what is going on or really in some logical way why this is happening. But in a clarity sense, I just thought, for whatever reason, I felt like I didn't really have any other option than to trust God. Mm. Mm. But surely, well, and I'm very sorry for your loss of your friend, um, but surely a tragedy like this would push you away from belief in God. Many people believe, reject God for, because of the suffering in the world. Why wasn't this you? Yeah, I guess in some ways I'm a little unsure and unsure why I necessarily responded in trust, not accusation or, or, or pushing away or something. It was also a time in which I was actually really learning what Christianity was. So I think I didn't really know that from growing up mm -hmm. that clearly. I didn't really know what the gospel was. And I think for me, especially early on in uni, every single week, seeing more and more clearly who God is, uh, what he has done for us, namely in sending Jesus uh, to die for us, mm -hmm. I just had in my mind, in this situation, who am I going to choose to trust? Am I just going to trust in myself and, and uh, push God away and go rogue and do things on my own? Mm -hmm. And I guess I just felt well, this is a God that knows me and that loves me enough that, and I can see that clearly uh, through the Bible. I just felt I could, I could do nothing but trust uh, him. Mm. Yeah. So in many ways, this incident with your friend was almost a catalyst for you to take the Christian faith or take God more seriously, perhaps. Oh, yeah, it was definitely that. Yeah, it really put questions of faith much more on the agenda too, saying if I call myself a Christian or, you know, which I would have done my whole life growing up, as I said, going mm. to church. But yeah, this really pushed me back and went, well, what does it mean? Does it have any impact on, on your life? And so how is your life different now? Uh, I mean, from this experience, it gave me a real thirst to know and uh, I guess understand my own faith and, and know God. Mm -hmm. And through that, that has sort of changed everything, really. It's changed what I value in life. It's changed my career pathway of wanting to work in Christian ministry. Yeah, I know. Mm. Oh, thank you. All yeah. things. So Andy, how does the book of Job speak to Bryn's experience? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting to hear Bryn share a bit of his story in terms of the, the main question that was raised for him was, is God trustworthy and can he trust God with his life? Because mm. uh, I, think, I think in the end, that's probably the biggest question for Job. So he asks lots of why questions, but it, it seems that the question behind the question for Job, the thing that he keeps coming back to is not necessarily tell me exactly how the world works and what you're doing in it, but can I really believe and trust in the light of my experience and the experience of others I see ar around me? Because his suffering makes him aware of the wider created order, if you like, or the mm. world he lives in. 
can the creator really be trusted with his world and can I trust him with my life? Is he for me? Mm. And I think that's, that's the fundamental question that's asked and answered actually in the book. In the book. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bryn, do you resonate with the character of Job or the story of Job at different points? Oh, yeah, I think definitely like some of the conclusions Andy was saying there of mm. even though you, you inevitably do have questions and I did have questions of, of why in certain degrees, I think the big answers were for more found in who is God and can I trust him? Mm, mm. Well, why don't we have a bit of a think about some of the book of Job now. So in chapter 10 of the Old Testament book of Job, the character Job reflects on his experience of suffering and says in verses 1 and 2, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. So Andy, why is Job so bitter? Is this about the fact that he feels that his suffering is unjust? Yeah, I think uh, the, the problem Job has is that he has three friends mm-hmm. who at first come to comfort him. Yep. And uh, the first thing they do is actually sit in silence with him uh, for seven days and seven nights, which is their greatest contribution to Job when they keep their mouth shut. <laughs> okay. As soon as they open their mouths, it's when they say it best when they say nothing at all, to quote that yep. great song. Um, <laughs> you say as soon as they start to open their mouths, they're trying to make sense of Job's suffering. It's, sh- it's shaking them up too mm. because it doesn't seem to fit with their worldview that it goes well for the righteous, mm. it goes bad for the wicked. Mm. And so they are basically saying this is God's judgment coming yeah. down on you. It's karma, I suppose. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, they don't use that word, but that's almost the kind of concept they're having in relating to God. It's almost a a mechanical cause and effect view of the universe. Mm, mm. And Job is grappling with that and responding to that. And that leads him to respond to God, you know, is this what you really think, God? If it is, make the charges clear. But being someone who's suffering, he's constantly swinging in his emotions. So he'll say, of course, that's not what it is. So later on in chapter 10, he talks about God's love for him that he's known since birth. Mm. Um, But then he goes, but this is happening now. So you you took such great care in forming my life. Why do you now seem to be dismantling my life? Mm, mm. And he describes his life often as as a kind of living death or a half-life, you know. Um, At one level, it would be better if I died, but I don't want to be apart from God. But if I keep living, it doesn't really feel like it's worth living. Mm. And he's asking the where are you, God, in the midst of that. Well, Job continues and raises the problem of evil in verse 3, where he writes, Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands, while you smile on the plans of the wicked? So, Andy, how does Job approach this problem where he asks God, Does it please you to oppress me? It seems like he thinks that God is the source of his suffering and misery. Yeah, yeah. At one level, one of the big messages of the book of Job is one of the most uncomfortable ones, and, and that is there's a sense in which Job is blaming the right person. So he's right to cry out and expect some kind of answer from God. And by doing that, he's actually saying, I believe that God's in control and he's, he's in charge of this world. And indeed, from the very beginning of the book, the way that it starts is that a lot of suffering comes through, we find out, he doesn't find out, but the reader finds out through the hand of Satan. But it, it's ultimately God even standing behind and working through the bad things that are happening. Mm, mm. So one, one thing that the book of Job is, is raising and that Job is discovering in the, in the practice of his life is that in order to approach the problems of suffering and evil, we actually need a big view of God, not a smaller view of God that lets him off the hook. Right. Now that creates other questions. So it means God's then to blame for evil? It means, it means there's an asymmetry so the, the, the intention that, that Satan has and the intention of God are completely different. Mm-hmm. So God's goal is to demonstrate the reality of Job's faith and to grow him in his confidence in him. Satan's goal in suffering is just to tear him down. No one can trust God for nothing. He asks the question, it's a big question for the book in chapter 1, I think it's chapter 1, verse 6, does Job fear God for nothing? Mm-hmm. And that question keeps coming back to us. The, the question of evil, though, is an interesting one in terms of a challenge brought because it's only a problem for Christians because we, we have this big view of God. But if, if all there is is what is 
and you don't believe in God at all, well, evil's a sort of a non-concept. Yeah. It's sort of a weird complaint to have because yeah. it's just stuff happens and then you die. Mm. <laughs> in some way, that's what Job, Job's experiences kind of demonstrates that as well. Yeah. 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 Um, so what about you, Brian? When, when you became serious in your faith, was the fact that maybe you couldn't explain all the suffering in, your, in the world, was that a significant barrier for you in accepting the Christian faith? I think thankfully for myself, it was never this huge hurdle uh, in some, I guess, intellectual sense or something. I think for me, like in sort of looking at that question, um, you know, why does suffering happen? Why would God allow it? Uh, like Andy was saying, uh, I had a big picture of God, that he is in control, that he is sovereign, that he is yeah. all-knowing and all-powerful. So then for me, the question of, well, why does suffering happen? Why has it happened in my own life? Why does it happen in other people's lives? Really came down to the question of, well, is God good? And I guess in some ways we've got these tensions of some experiences of our life um, of suffering occurring. And in one sense, what I'd say, like the confusion I had, a pretty small view of what is going on in this suffering, what is happening. Mm. But I think throughout the entirety of the Bible, we see that God is trustworthy and he works to bless people and yeah i think he works for people's good mm -hmm. now the book concludes with god speaking to job in a series of speeches in chapters 38 to 41 so andy what does god say to him yeah it, it seems like a complete disconnect when you first read it because you have all of these incredible and honest uh questions being asked far more passionately and incisively than Richard Dawkins or anyone like that. Mm -hmm. It's almost embarrassing that they're in the Bible. And it's just builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up and you think, we need an answer here. God finally breaks his silence, which is what we've all been waiting for. And that's what Job wants more than anything else. He wants to hear from God. But he doesn't enter into the debate with the friends directly. He starts talking about the world that he's made and that he maintains in, in some detail. Mm -hmm. One writer has called it sublime irrelevance. Right. It's, it's wonderful poetry. Yeah. It's sublime. Uh, people compare it with the epic writing of Homer. It, you know, it rates in terms of great literature. But at one level, who cares in terms of what has God being in control of the weather got to do with this guy going through this incredible pain or, or mm. feeding wild donkeys on the mountainside. That's all really interesting and touching. What's that got to do with the fact that Job's got this skin disease that makes him loathsome and mm. wishes he was dead? And I think, strangely though, these speeches are comforting to Job. And I think that what is actually happening is that, and this is what often happens when you read the Bible, is that Job is learning that actually there are other questions that are more important to be answered. So it's not, it's not that Job's complaints are dismissed or rejected. In fact, God upholds the speech and says that it was he spoke of what was right about him, whereas the friends spoke about, about him what was wrong. I think one of the great things the book of Job affirms is that God is big enough to hear our complaints. He's a perfect and loving parent, if you like, who doesn't get embarrassed by those questions or by the the, the emotion with which they come uh, and the, even the anger. He's a very patient uh, father. But the big thing, what Job receives is what in the end he really needs and that is the assertion that although you cannot understand why everything happens that does happen in your own life, let alone in the wider world, because you're not God, I am God, so that's, that's both a humbling and comforting thing to be told that. You're the creature, I'm the creator. You can be sure and know, as we've been saying, that I am for creation, that in the things and for you, I'm for you and you can trust me and that you need to trust in me. And that's the most important thing for Job. And he actually mm. finds relief even before his suffering ends because he has a renewed confidence that God is in charge and he's for him and he holds him close. Mm. And I think really, we're really like babies in God's universe, mm. no matter how big our brains are. Mm. And that at a certain point it comes to, you just rest in the arms of the one who is greater than you, who made you and who loves you. Mm. Yeah. So a couple of questions have come through on our text line here from our live audience. Um, Job has a happy ending, but much innocent suffering doesn't. For example, the Holocaust. Does this undermine its message? Yeah, if, if the book of Job was the only book that we had, 
we might answer yes to that because the happy ending in terms of Job is uh, it's very material. So he, his wife survives and, and uh, uh, they have 10 more children, believe it or not, and his prosperity is returned to him and he's able once again to be a gracious host and philanthropist, which is one of Job's things. Mm -hmm. He was a wealthy man who used his money well. And of course, the reality is that for many people, Christian or otherwise, that's not their experience. Mm. Uh, I, it must be true. Millions of Christians have been martyred for their faith in Christ, for example. Mm. But read in the light of the whole Bible, that I think that's a happy ending that actually anticipates the happy ending of the new heavens and the new earth. So that what happens in our lives now is not the end of the story. Mm, mm. There's future judgment and there's future glory. Uh, God is in the business of bringing about a new heavens and a new earth. Mm. But that, that deserves a much fuller answer. <laughs> yeah. So wrapping up, Bryn, Andy, why would someone trust God in the face of suffering? I would just say that God reveals himself to be trustworthy above all. I see that on the cross. I see that all through the history of the Old Testament, I see time and time again, God upholds his promises and not a single one of them actually fails. Mm. Yeah, God is not distant. He's not aloof. He's not just a concept to be debated over. He's a person who's entered into creation and shared our suffering and pain in Jesus as, and as Prince of his death on the cross, and he's done something about it. And the resurrection, which I believe is an historical event, underlines the reality of Jesus' claims and the hope that we can have of real and eternal life. Mm. Let me leave you with the Bible's answer to the big question. Why would someone trust God in the face of suffering? From Job 42, 1 to 3. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. I look forward to you joining us next time for Bigger Questions. Please thank our guests today, Bryn Waitman and Andy Prido. Enjoy Bigger Questions? You can help us keep asking them for as little as $1 a podcast. Support the show. Go to patreon.com slash biggerquestions.